really four theories of why you had an operation in the past that was successful and uh, and that was a fusion operation and now you're looking at the possibility of needing another operation usually because you have nerve pinching at an adjacent level. By the way, that happens about nine to one more commonly above a prior fusion than a below a prior fusion. Uh, there are a couple of risk factors for that. Female, older age, mean age of greater than 70, uh, long fusions, fusions to the sacrum, uh, or spinal pelvic imbalance. We'll go through what that means. I don't want to spoil uh, all, at all of the talk. So the, uh, the first theory is the one that I think is, is the most commonly understood, and that is that if one level of your spine is fused, then that level doesn't move anymore. All the other guys got to work harder. So the, uh, the analogy I always use of that is if you've got a five-man rowing team and you throw one guy overboard, then the other four guys got to row harder to keep up with everybody else. And um, as you fuse more and more levels, you're working those other levels harder and harder. And there's a number of biomechanical studies which support that. You can take a uh, cadaveric spine, put it in a spine simulator, and measure the adjacent level stresses, intradiscal pressure, lambda strain, all kinds of things, and show that, yes, we indeed do have greater stress at levels directly next to where a spine has been fused in the past. That was uh, really the genesis of a lot of uh, mid-2000s uh, research into uh, disc replacement, facet replacement, and motion preservation technologies, a number of which are still on the market and can be very successful in, uh, in very specific circumstances. But unfortunately, still, fusion is a substantial portion of what we do. It works really well, but it does have uh, have some uh, some side effects with adjacent with creating adjacent level disease. So, loss of motion is one of the things that can lead to uh, biomechanical uh, change, and uh, uh, that is one theory of why you can get adjacent segment disease. So, the next theory is the concept of. Uh, progression of underlying disease, meaning if you have heart disease, you're going to have more than one bad artery. If you have spinal disease, you'll likely have more than one level that's bad in your back. In fact, any good news, uh, if you've got a bad back, you probably have a bad neck as well. Um, the, uh, there are people who have a herniated disc at one level, never have another problem, and have no substantial disc degeneration. There's also people who their uh, uncle and brother and sister and everybody else in the family has had uh, herniated disc or spinal stenosis or a number of other uh, uh, spinal problems. <laughs> And with those people, the best way to think about it is what we are doing is we are putting a uh, uh, we're putting a bandaid on one individual problem. We are not changing all of your genetics. We are there if we fuse one level that has uh, met indications for needing a fusion, that doesn't preclude you from any of the other bad problems that can happen in the future. And sometimes it's just progression of the underlying problem. There's a lot of data that would support this as being a substantial uh, generator of adjacent level problems. And uh, the fact that we see uh, an increase in people who have uh, uh, spinal disorders and need neck uh, operations as well. Um, in uh, the uh, spondylolisthesis, each other spondylolisthesis tends to have a higher uh, adjacent level rate than, than something like ischemic spondylolisthesis, which is more of an injury. Um, and people with one disc herniation tend to have more disc herniations. If you've got congenital stenosis, you tend to uh, uh, need multiple operations. So there's a, there's definitely a genetic underpinning to these things. Mm -hmm.